Hey everyone, welcome to this session about Azure Container Apps. So a session uh, not about Kubernetes uh, and maybe even a way to say goodbye Kubernetes for some applications. We'll see how far we get. Now my name is uh, Geert Bake. I work for the Kronos Group as a Cloud Native Architect. I'm also a Microsoft Azure MVP. You can contact me via uh, Twitter or via my YouTube channel where you'll find similar videos, uh, similar to this presentation. And there's actually a video, one of the latest uh, ones, which is about the sample application I'm going to use in this session. Uh, it's called OpenAI Tweet Generator on Azure Container App. So feel free to look at that uh, for some more details. Now, there are also some resources available. Everything I'm talking about is available on GitHub, so in the ACA OpenAI uh, repository. And you'll also find a site which is called aca.super.site. That one creates or has another uh, demo that uh, goes into some more detail deploying different container apps to a single container apps and environment. So it's a different demo than the one I'm using here. It's a bit more elaborate, so we feel free to look at that one as well. Now, I'm not going to talk about the advantages of containers or why you should actually develop in containers and what's the effect on developers and so on. We know this, right? Uh, I believe that you are convinced that that is the way to go. But then you have, of course, the need to deploy these containers to, yeah, let's say, a service that can handle uh, that. And depending on the cloud vendor or on-premises, there are lots of different ways to run your containers. When you look at the Azure Cloud, if you're looking on a range from simple to more complex, there are several services that can run your containers. The first one is Container Instances, Microsoft's first attempt at containers as a service. It is a rather bare-bone service in the sense that it doesn't have some of the higher level features like uh, TLS termination, custom certificates, uh, scaling, and so on. But it's quite good at, let's say, throwing a container at it, uh, doing some, let's say, more complex task, running it, only paying for the seconds it is running, and then actually stopping uh, that container. And it supports uh, GPUs and as well, so it can be used for uh, workloads that require uh, GPUs. And it supports Linux and Windows containers. Now, normally for, let's say, customer-facing applications, especially web apps and web APIs, we would not recommend to use the, the more bare-bones container instances. We would recommend, first of all, to look at app services. App services has existed for quite a long time. It is comparable to things like Google App Engine and Elastic Beanstalk, and it doesn't even need containers. You can just have your code, the code can be thrown at app service, so to speak, and it supports several runtimes like Node and Python, and of course, also .NET. Um, that already exists for quite some time, and later running containers on top of app services was added as well. App services does have higher level features, like for example, uh, TLS termination, custom certificates, um, Azure Key Vault integration for your secrets. It has a, a good scaling story as well. There are lots of different features available. Now, if your applications are somewhat more complex or you have a lot of background workers to run, then normally we wouldn't recommend app services. We would recommend to, well, at least in the past, to use something like Kubernetes. Of course, there's more complexity there, but you have much more control over things like uh, what kind of hardware are we using? Do we need GPUs or not? Are we going to use Linux or Windows containers? Uh, do we have a complex microservices application? We need service meshes, maybe other kinds of tooling that exists in, in the market. Kubernetes is extremely flexible, of course, at the expense of some more complexity. Now, what Microsoft has done is create a newer service, which is called Container Apps, and that's actually in the middle between app services and Kubernetes services. So it can run the workloads that app services can run quite easily, but it's also optimized for creating more complex applications and microservices applications. In fact, if you look at container apps a bit more from a bit from a bit closer, you see it's actually a serverless containers as a service solution optimized for microservices. Containers as a service means you can focus on the app, not the infrastructure. 
if you have to do Kubernetes, you know you still have to think about Kubernetes upgrades, security of your nodes, security patching, maybe replacing the node image once in a while. And you have to also think more about the networking and security story. What about ingress, how to do ingress and so on. So there is much more focus still on infrastructure with something like Kubernetes, not so with something like container apps. It is serverless in the sense that it can scale dynamically based on external events can be HTTP events, but also other events like messages in a bus, for example, or in a queue. It's also serverless in the sense that it can scale to zero. When there is no work to be done, then there will, no, then, then there will be no containers running. That means you also don't pay for your containers. Now, serverless also means that you're gonna be built by the second and for memory and CPU consumed. So it's a, effectively a serverless platform, very similar in that sense to something like, for example, Google Cloud Functions, which is also a serverless containers as a service solution. Now, Microsoft could have built this on their own, but they decided to build this on open source. And actually, Kubernetes is under the hood. All your container apps, when you run them, they actually run in a Kubernetes namespace. But you don't see that unless you delve quite deep. Um, and you don't have access to the Kubernetes API server. You always have to use the simpler container apps APIs to actually work with Kubernetes underneath. Basically, you don't have to care about Kubernetes. That's the main point here. Keda is used for this dynamic scaling based on events. Keda is the Kubernetes event-driven autoscaler that you can also install on your own clusters. It's not unique to container apps, but it comes in the box, is installed for you and updated for you. The same thing goes for Dapper, the distributed application runtime. Basically a toolbox for developers to make creating distributed applications easier. Well, Dapper, again, comes in the box, is updated for you, and you use it if you want to create microservices applications. It's optional, though. And for networking, Microsoft is using Envoy. It's used for external access or public access to your containers, so for ingress. It's also used for internally making your applications available in the, in the internal container uh, environment, as we'll see uh, later. Now, Container Apps, of course, is a service. It's a pass service. It's a platform as a service solution. That also means that there are limitations, right, that are not currently enabled on the service. A couple of things here that might be important is that only Linux containers are supported. You can't use any hardware, underlying hardware you want. That's not selectable. You can't use hardware with GPUs or use GPUs entirely. That's not possible. You cannot, for example, use ARM servers. That you cannot do. And containers are limited to two CPU cores and four gigs of RAM. So for many of these limitations, of course, there's an alternative solution. That solution would be to run that workload on Kubernetes, which of course is flexible enough to do all those kinds of things. So it's always an evaluation you have to do, right? When you have an application, look at what the application needs and then look, can we run this on container apps? Is that sufficient? And if not, of course, use something else. So it's not, let's say, 100% goodbye Kubernetes from now on. It's like with any service, you have to uh, look at your application and then select the application or the service that is good for your application. Now, as a reminder, what you can build on top of app services, sorry, container apps, uh, the following applications. First of all, APIs and web apps with complete automatic scaling built in. So by default, even scaling is configured between zero and I think even 10 instances, and you have to control the way you want to do scaling, but there's no configuration to do if you want to scale based on concurrent HTTP requests. You just set the minimum and the maximum, and that's it. For these kind of applications, you can also split your traffic. Envoy is used to do that. For example, if you have a new version, we call it revisions here, and you want to send 10% of traffic to the new version and 90 to the old version for, for example, a canary release, well, you can do so with the Container Apps APIs quite easily. Container Apps can also be used for background processing. 
For example, you have a container that has to continuously run as a background process. No problem. And you can scale that container based on CPU and memory consumed. In that case, CADA has to be configured to uh, configure this scaling. It can also be used for event processing. For example, you need to read messages from a topic or a queue and you want to automatically scale based on the number of messages in that queue, you can configure a CADA scaler to do so. That queue can be in any cloud. Most kind of queues in clouds are supported. So in Azure, that would typically be Azure Service Bus. But there's also support for things like RabbitMQ and uh, Kafka and so on. Now you might think, well, don't we have something like serverless platforms like Lambda and Google Cloud Functions and Azure Functions to do this? Yes, but in most cases with those kind of solutions, you have to follow a specific programming model. In this case, you design, you write your code the way you want to, package it in a container and use that for your event processing. I sometimes hear the term using things like Azure Functions for lightweight event processing uh, and then this for more like heavy duty event processing. Well, I'm, I'm not going to make a decision on that, but that's sometimes uh, how it is uh, described. And then, of course, you have microservices. As explained, uh, container apps can run microservices um, with optional Dapper integration there. And these microservices within an environment, and we'll talk about an environment later, they can easily talk to each other over the internal network. That, that's, of course, needed when they do uh, synchronous uh, communication or you use asynchronous uh, communication of course with a service bus or something like that that depends of course on your application architecture so a whole wide range of applications that you can write on top of container apps but in the past we would say well this type of app maybe you can use uh, app services and for this one you have to use kubernetes now you actually have a choice that can do all of these quite well and then with exceptions, maybe you would go to Kubernetes depending on your application needs. Now to run a container app, right? to run your containers, you have to have a container apps environment. Such an environment is easily created, it takes a few minutes to create, and then you get access to this AKS under the hood. But again, remember, you don't have access to the Kubernetes APIs. It is just there for you, you don't have to worry about it. This environment is, is essentially free. The only thing which is not free is if you select log analytics to keep all your system and container logs historically. That of course consumes storage and there's a price to pay for keeping those logs historically. There's an option to also not use log analytics in a development environment, for example, to only see the current logs. That's great indeed for development, but for production you would normally enable log analytics to keep all your logs. So there's no need to configure any kind of logging tool or something like that uh, for this environment. It's, it's built in with log analytics integration. By default, such an environment gets a public IP and all the containers that have an ingress, they will get a automatic DNS name that links to that public IP. Now, of course, for most customers, they need to make these things available also on the internal network. You can optionally link a container apps environment at creation time that's important at creation time, not afterwards, link it to a virtual network. And if that virtual network is linked to, let's say, your on-prem network using a VPN, then you can connect to these container apps from the internal network. Now, I'm going to deploy later an application with two apps. I will have a UI and an API. Well, when we deploy the API, sorry, the UI for the first time, you will have container app one, my first container app and directly I will get my first revision running or my first version of my application. A revision runs replicas, zero or more replicas, depending on the scaling rules that you configured. And you can compare a replica with a pod on Kubernetes. So if you know something about pods, you know you can run multiple containers concurrently, like your main container and sidecar containers. You can do so in container apps as well. You can have things like init containers configured. You can have things like, for example, probing, like a liveness probe or a readiness probe. All these concepts that you know from Kubernetes are actually in container apps as well. You just configure them using the container apps API and under the hood, Kubernetes constructs are used. 
Another example, for example, would be to set a secret for a container app. A secret would actually be translated under the hood to a Kubernetes secret. Now, when I have my first version of my first revision and I deploy a new version of my application, by default, that second revision, that new version will become the active one and the old one will be deactivated and archived. And the system keeps like 100 of these past revisions. You can always reactivate them again later. The default revision mode is single. That means that the most recent deployed revision is the active one and receives all the traffic. But remember, when you do traffic splitting, you can actually have multiple revisions active and send a percentage of traffic between your different revisions. Right? Note in that case that the revisions scale independently. So if you have scale rules for your revisions, depending on the traffic ending up in each revision, each revision will scale independently from the other. And of course, I will have my API in the backend that I call. You'll see later what it does. Well, of course, I will have a second container app in the same environment. And in the, over the internal network, these two can communicate with each other. A container app's environment is basically a security boundary. I cannot really configure things like network policies and so on to separate my containers within an environment. If you need to separate containers from one another, you would use different container apps environments. Be aware that these container apps environments have limits as well. For example, there's a limit of having 40 CPU cores active within an environment. So if you have lots of container apps with lots of revisions, with lots of scaling rules, yeah, the scaling is never guaranteed because if you are reaching the limit of 40 cores per environment, of course you can't scale beyond that. So you have to a bit watch out what you do there. If you have scaling limits that need to go beyond what an environment can do, of course, there's still Kubernetes available. You can go to even like 5,000 nodes today, I think, in Azure. So scaling uh, in that sense is not really uh, an issue there. Good. Now, now we have to think about how we deploy to a container apps environment. And without going into details about how we actually deploy the environment itself, what about developer productivity? And we know it is very difficult if you want to let a developer deploy to a real Kubernetes cluster. Um, letting them do that all by themselves is usually not a very good idea. You would, would, you would provide such environments to them. But with container apps, if a developer has access to a resource group in a, let's say, developer subscription, a developer, when working on source code, can actually create a container app quite easily from the local machine with the Azure CLI. And here you see the Azure container app up command, where the focus is or should be on the dash dash source option that actually says, hey, look at my source files in the current directory. And if there's a Docker file in there, Please create a Docker image, upload the Docker image to a container registry, create a container app environment for me, and then create a container app, all with one command. And here you even make that container app available externally on the internet, so the ingress is configured automatically as well. Right? Here we do some other things. We say we have an existing environment already and so on and so on. But even if you don't give it the environment option there, it will create an environment for you automatically. So it's really easy for developers to get their applications up and running quickly in the actual environment they're going to run in for them to test, for example, things like um, managed identity and stuff like that. So there's a big focus on this, let's say, inner loop, this developer productivity aspect. But of course, uh, in a production environment, you're going to automate the deployment of, of these systems. And for example, you would use, normally you would use Bicep, that's what we recommend for our customers. ARM, of course, is still supported. And if you're a Terraform user, no problem. I think since February this year, there's full support for Azure Container Apps in the Azure RM provider. And if you're so inclined, you can also use the Azure CLI or maybe even PowerShell uh, to deploy these, uh, these things for you. Um, now, BICEP, what would that mean? Huh? To create an environment, what would you have to do? Well, actually, just this. This is enough to create an environment and link it to a existing log analytics workspace. 
you compare this to the BICEP to deploy a Kubernetes cluster, there there's much more things to think about. Uh, how many nodes, how many node pools, um, there are lots of things you have to configure in this case, yeah, this just gives us access to an underlying Kubernetes cluster you don't see. So the environment itself is a fairly simple thing. So this is all to deploy an environment. Now to deploy containers, you can also use BICEP. You don't have to know things like a Kubernetes YAML or use things like Helm charts and so on. This is just plain BICEP where we deploy a container app that we're gonna call something web UI. And what you see here is things like we configure a identity, we set all kinds of properties for ingress, and in the end we have a template. A template just like a pod template in a deployment where we specify the containers we want to run. This is highly comparable to that. So here we say run this image or use this image and set some environment variables. There are other things we can set here. For example, we can set things like the liveness probe, the readiness probe, they can be set in this template as well. And a bit higher, if we go back a bit, there we could also, for example, specify secrets and so on for our container app. So everything that I'm going to show you in a moment in the UI uh, that, will be, uh, that will be available um, in, uh, that is available in Bicep. Now the application we're going to create is a tweet generator. So this is the UI, which is very simple and ugly. I'm not a graphical designer here. You give it some text and a sentiment and it generates a, well, hopefully uh, funny in this case, tweet about Kubernetes. The tweet is generated by an open AI model, by the text DaVinci 003 model. And it's my API that does this uh, for us. The actual architecture of this application is here. So we have our container app environment, no VNet. So we get a public IP. And when we make a container app, in our case, the web UI available on the internet via its automatic ingress, we can reach that web, web UI quite easily. The web UI is also secured with Azure Active Directory. I will show you in a moment how that is done. And it's also enabled for Dapper because I'm going to use Dapper actually the Dapper Invoke API, only that, which is a very small part of Dapper. I'm going to use Dapper to call into my API in the backend and to find the API easily on the network. As you can see here on the slide as well, there's a managed identity connected to the container apps. If you have ever played with Kubernetes and trying to give Kubernetes a managed identity and then in Azure, I'm not talking about other clouds here, and there's quite some work to do and sometimes even it's confusing like you had the pod identity project but that's now you shouldn't use it anymore and now you should yeah, actually use a workload identity which uses federation there's quite some things to set up for that before that works a lot of yaml uh, to configure in this case i'm just saying hey uh, my web app here should have a managed entity and it's done it's a few lines of code in bicep and it's done we are using this managed identity to actually authenticate to Azure Container Registry because that's a private registry and we have to say who we are before we can pull the image from that container registry. The API is also using a managed identity to retrieve the Azure OpenAI secret from Key Vault. Container Apps today has no native integration with Key Vault. So if you want to retrieve things from Key Vault, your code has to do that at runtime and the API Within in Python is doing that using the Microsoft uh, uh, identity libraries and the key vault libraries. It's the API itself is not really doing anything. It's on its own. It's going to call into an Azure OpenAI model to call a model which I call Twitter, but it actually is configured to use the text DaVinci 003 model. They're most, the most powerful model today in Azure OpenAI service. Um, but that's not really important for this uh, for this uh, presentation. So let's see what it looks like in the portal. So here we are at the container apps environments in my subscription and the one I deployed with BICEP, what you have seen earlier, the, the simple BICEP code, a few lines of code, that is this environment. Now in an environment, there's not that much to do. We can have some things set at the environment level like certificates we want to use when we want to use custom names for our container apps or even things like a custom DNS suffix for all my container apps, but that's in preview today. 
What we also did with deployment is we configured a log analytics workspace. You would see that in the logging options. You can clearly see to which workspace we are sending our logs. To see the historical logs, we can just go to the logs section here. And if you have ever worked with log analytics, you know you can use certain queries here, KQL queries to basically see what's happening. For example, if I want to see my container apps console logs and I want to find everything that contains AI API, I can just run this and I see all the historical logs that were kept that contain AI API here. And of course we have to drill down further to find what we want. If I'm only interested in the current log stream, the current logs or the most recent logs, I can look at them as well without having to create a query. Now I am more interested in the apps section. Our container apps are listed here and we start with the web UI that gives us the UI to indeed uh, get our tweet generated. And an important aspect here is of course the ingress. How do we configure external access to this container app? Well, the ingress Configuration in container apps compared to Kubernetes is of course very simple. We simply enable ingress and we say we accept traffic from anywhere. Other options are to limit traffic to the environment only. That would be the setting for my API. And if we deploy a container app environment linked to a VNet, we can actually make this container app environment only available internally. These kinds of ingresses with external environments, they only support HTTP. So we can only access our application on port 443 or 80. No other ports are supported. And that's important to know. Because this is essentially a reverse proxy and Envoy is used for this reverse proxying. Envoy, of course, needs to know the port that my container is using to accept HTTP requests. And in my case, that's 5000. Now, what I've also done is I've also configured authentication for this application. It is a built-in feature into container apps that allows you to put an identity provider in front of your app. It's basically a piece of middleware that does this authentication for you automatically. Now you choose as a developer if you want to use this or you roll your own integration in your application. That's basically up to you. In my case, uh, I have to go to this app using a certain URL. So if I go to the overview, the ingress that I've just shown you, that results in an application URL, which is this one over here. When I click on this, I'm getting the following UI and we'll see what happens. And it, it stays black for a moment. And the reason why it stays black is because this application is scaling to zero. So here you see the effect of the, let's say, cold startup of my container app before it can respond uh, with something. And in my case now, I see my application. I can type in what I want, for example, Kubernetes, and let's make it a serious tweet this time and see if my application works. And indeed, here's my serious tweet about Kubernetes. Now, this works. Now you haven't seen the authentication because already I had my cookie already configured. I was already authenticated. But if you would go to that uh, to that application URL, you would get a Azure Active Directory login to go into the app. Now I also configured my application to use Dapper. I talked about that. Dapper is enabled for my application. I have to give my application a ID. That is web UI here. Now. I'm going to call my API using Dapper. The, what, what does that mean? Well, that means I have to do an HTTP call, well, in this case, to that other container, and I have to find it on the network. How is that done? Well, what I'm using here is something I've set as an environment variable, which is the URL that we're going to use Dapper with, and this is the invoke URL. Basically, what you have to think about is Dapper is a sidecar in your replica. So the sidecar runs next to your application container. Sidecars are addressable over local host. The Dapper sidecar runs on port 3500. Because Dapper has an HTTP API, we use the invoke API to call a method called generate on a Dapper 
application, a Dapper ID, which is OpenAI. And if you look into my applications and you go to my API here, you'll see that my Dapper is enabled on this API and that the Dapper ID given is indeed OpenAI. So this name can be used by the web UI to easily translate this into a IP address so it can find the API on the network and then send the HTTP call. The generate method basically can be called on this API. So yes, we have Dapper enabled on both applications, enabling Dapper to be used to do HTTP calls with the invoke API there. Let's go back to the web UI because the web UI also has a identity configured. This identity was configured with a couple of lines in BICEP and we assigned a user assigned identity. That basically means there's an Azure Active Directory identity that can be granted specific access rights that our application needs. I'm now in that identity in Azure and I can check the role assignments. I've given these assignments using BICEP. And you can see that this identity has the right ACR pull role to pull from our container registry, this one over here. And we've also given it the key vault secrets user role on this key vault that's used by the API to retrieve the secret. Yes, I've given the UI and the API the same identity. I don't have to do that. I could give them multiple or different identities there. Let's go back to my web UI. And let's take a look at revision management, because that's, of course, where all the magic happens. When I deploy my container app, I'm getting a revision. I'm now in single revision mode, which means that only the latest revision is active and receiving 100% of traffic. If you go to that revision, you'll see that there's some details here and there's also an option to, let's say, restart your revision. It's a bit similar to restarting your Kubernetes deployment, really, with the kubectl tool. That's what's happening in, in the background. Yeah, sometimes this restart is required. For example, you have probably seen that there are secrets here. Secrets allow us to define secrets at the container apps level, which actually are secrets at the Kubernetes level. But if these secrets change, the containers don't pick them up automatically. So a restart would be needed to pick up a change in the value of our secret. And by the way, today, these secrets, you have to set the value here directly. You can tell container apps to grab the value of the secret from a key vault. So this key vault integration is what I talked about earlier. That's not available today. But that is on the roadmap and coming. Now, my revision is now running. I will, of course, have certain things configured in this revision. So I can see the containers in this revision. That's the web UI, and this is coming from Azure Container Registry using a GitHub uh, SHA or a Git SHA as the image tag here. My container has environment variables, the invoke URL we talked about, and I didn't configure health probes here. But if you go to my application to the API here, in the API, I did configure some health probes just as an example, and you'll see that this is exactly what you expect from Kubernetes help probes. This is an HTTP get liveness probe to a probe URL on port 5001 in this case for this container. And I'm having a readiness probe which is using the same, uh, the same uh, uh, port and, and so on uh, to connect to the system. And you're seeing here port, uh, this would actually be not port, but should be the, the URL or the path basically. <laughs> That's quite a, it's a small error in the, in the UI here. If I go back to my applications and I go back to my UI, we also have our scaling and replicas here. So with scale and replicas, we can configure scaling for the app. And notice that I told you this already, that HTTP scaling is built in by default. So if I set 0 to, that means scaling is active based on HTTP requests. If I don't get any requests, well, in that case, it will scale to 0. The default is 10 concurrent HTTP requests, but you can change this to another number if you want to by setting the scale rule. In this session, we're not looking at other kinds of scale rules like KEDA scale rules that scale based on the number of messages in a queue, for instance. 
or a Kafka topic, that's also possible with custom scale rules that you set. If we go back a little bit below, we see that all these container apps are integrated with Azure Monitor. So they all give you metrics that you can evaluate and you can also alert on. So to see, for example, when did my when, when did a replica restart and so on. And you can configure alerts off of this. Of course, these containers also have their own log stream. Now, this is the current log stream, the real-time logs. Well, the real-time logs, of course, won't be available if the app is not running. So I have to quickly hit the app here uh, and just open this in a new tab so I can actually get uh, the application, the container app, started again and up and running. So if I give it some time and I go back to the log stream, I can see the current logs for this container. Of course, if I want to see the historical logs, I would go to the logs option over here. Then as a last thing, there's a console as well you can get. You can easily get a console to your running containers. In this case, we do that with shut. And I can, for example, look at what's on my container. And indeed, here I have my app code running, uh, which is giving me the, uh, the uh, front-end UI here. So this is all the stuff that you can that you can configure. We didn't look at all things, for example, things like custom domains. So you could, for example, make a custom domain for this one and say, I want this to be called tweet dot something else. You can connect your own custom domain with your own certificate to do this. It's not automated, so you would have to get a certificate and add it here. There's like no automatic certificate integration like some other Azure services actually have. Now, if I go to the apps again and go to the API, I have to show you one thing which is different in the API, and that is, of course, the ingress. The API should not be available over the internet. The API should be limited to the container apps environment. So ingress has to be enabled. If you don't enable ingress, you can't have traffic flowing to it. But ingress is enabled, and only within the container apps environment, you can actually reach this application. Similar as before, only HTTP, and then of course the target port for our container, what is it using to accept HTTP uh, traffic. For the rest, all the rest is very, very similar. The, the only difference here is that I'm never scaling to zero, I'm leaving the API up and running, and that's by setting min and max to one. So it's always running, so I can always go to my log stream, it's always available, and yeah, because I have debug logging here, you can actually see the, the full response. Okay, I think this is uh, enough for the, for the demonstration. So you have seen indeed, this is what the deployment of an environment and container apps look like. If you have ever seen Kubernetes or Kubernetes in uh, um, Azure, for example, you can clearly see the difference that it's of course much simpler when it comes to configuring this and seeing what is going on uh, in, in the system. Sure, there are some limitations, but always evaluate your application and see, is this application, uh, can it run in container apps without any issue? I would recommend to use container apps instead of Kubernetes. If your applications are more complex, of course, feel free to use Kubernetes. It's there for a reason. So, of course, use it when it is needed. That's it. Thank you for listening and uh, yeah, hoping to see you another time. Bye-bye.